thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my call
Well, greetings, good morning, and welcome home. Uh, we miss you. We're so glad that you're logging on this morning and joining us at Laredo First Assembly online service. Uh, uh, we definitely have a, a, a hole in our heart missing you being on campus with us, but thank you for joining us online. For those of you who are new to uh, Laredo First Assembly, thank you for watching this morning. We're, we're so glad you're with us and have tuned in, and, and uh, we look forward to the message this morning. Uh, Pastor Gilbert's going to be bringing us a message of hope from the story of Hagar. You are not going to want to miss it. Uh, but I'd like to ask you to take a moment and uh, share the link that you're watching. Share it with your friends and your influence group, those who uh, you have contact with. Invite them to join our service and, and be with us this morning. I know you're going to be blessed, and, and uh, we hope that, uh, that you are enjoying being at home and, and having church service with us, even though you're not present uh, together. You're present with your family or whoever you're with watching. And, we're so glad you joined us today. And, and we'd love it if you would take a, a second and take a picture of yourself um, uh, with you, you watching your, your stream live, wherever you're at, whether it's your TV or your tablet or your phone. And uh, let, us, uh, let us see you at, at home having church service. And so if you want to share that with us, we'd love to see it on our social media. So tag us uh, if you're on Instagram or Facebook, if you're putting it to your feed or your post, hashtag it LFA at home. L-F-A-A-T at home, hashtag LFA at home. And then if you're putting it on your, your story with Instagram, you have to tag us, put at Laredo First Assembly. And uh, we would love to see you. We, we, you see us, but we miss you. And uh, we'd love to see you. So, so post your, your picture and, and tag us on it. Let us know you're there. And again, share the link. Uh, and if you are a guest, we just want to say welcome home to you. Uh, we, we believe that you can find a spiritual home here with us, a spiritual family. And, and we are so glad to be in your life through your platform. And I know you're, you're going to be blessed today. So um, welcome to our service and, and uh, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Laredo First Assembly. And, and you can follow along with all of our uh, services and opportunities for ministry. Hopefully we're going to be back soon uh, with many of our ministry programs, our family-oriented programs. And uh, we'd love for you to be updated and, and up to speed. We also want to invite you to join us Wednesday night for our Bible study. Uh, it, it's going to be on the Facebook and YouTube platforms, 7 p.m. Uh, right here. Uh, jump in with us during the middle of our week as well. So we welcome you and we invite you to, to be with us on an on a ongoing basis. Thanks for joining us today. Also want to remind you, if you have young children, our kids' church service is also online. So right after this service, uh, you can hop onto our website, Laredo First Assembly, and click the Kids Church link, and, and they're going to have videos from our kids' leaders and some worship videos and our memory verse and lesson for the day. They're talking about the Bible and how the Bible is God's word and how to read it and, and delve in. So uh, get your kids and jump in uh, right after this service, and uh, it's on our website. So we, we know that they'll enjoy that as well. But we're just glad you're with us today. Have you been, have you been keeping in touch? Hopefully you've been uh, connecting with your family and friends and checking on them. Uh, you know, I was reading this week in my devotion, the Bible says, let everyone not only look out for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. So hopefully right now you're, you're checking on your family members, you're checking on your neighbors and uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, seeing how they're doing, making sure that you're staying connected to one another. Uh, it's definitely an interesting season, but we believe we're going to be back very soon and can't wait, can't wait to be with you. It's time for us to have our tithe and offering. And so I wanna invite you to take a moment, um, stay on the, the, the platform you're on, whether you're on your laptop or your uh, tablet and uh, grab another device, maybe your phone or, or um, uh, something that you can get on the internet and give your tithe and offering today uh, through our app or through our website, um, but do it as an act of your worship to the Lord. Uh, I know you probably enjoyed our, our worship time and song out in our courtyard. I know this uh, song's probably blessed your heart and, I can't wait to be back together, but giving is a form of our worship to God. And in, even during tough or difficult seasons of our life, when we give to the Lord, we're continuing to show our trust in him. And, and I want to say thank you to our church family and members who are faithful in your giving and your support. For those of you who might be just logging on and want to donate and give uh, to the ministries of our church, um, uh, now more than ever, the ministries of the church are needed and people are in need and to continue to meet the needs and for the church to function, the tithe and the offering is needed. And, and it's, a, it's a part of our worship to God. So thank you for your faithfulness in that. 
um, and, and take a few moments right now to log on. You can give through our website, you can give through our app. Those of you who have been set up on our text in church, you can give that way as well. Uh, and, and those of you who continue to give through your uh, check, uh, in the, you can do that in the mail right now. Um, our offices are closed during the week, but you can mail it to us, 6103 North McPherson. Um, and we look forward to seeing you. So God bless you as you give this morning. Remember, keeping the, the ministries of the church functioning is an is a important thing that we as a body of Christ do. So thank you for your, your love and your generosity in this, in this season. And along those lines, I want to remind you that even though our offices are closed during the week, we are still uh, functioning, and uh, our office phones are forwarding to phones that people are answering. And if for some reason you don't immediately get that message, please, please leave a message. Uh, our church number is 956-727-7954. If you need, uh, please reach out to your church uh, leaders and family and staff if you're in need. Uh, and you can also email us at connect at Laredo First Assembly, uh, dot com. So we want to stay in touch with you. We love you. I know you're going to be blessed by the word today. And I uh, wanted to just give you an update. Pastor Gilbert is bringing the word this morning uh, because Pastor Oscar, he, he injured his back and uh, he has been to the doctor and he's getting some treatment. So I'm gonna ask you to pray for him. Uh, he just wasn't in a place to be able to stand and preach the, the word for this whole hour time, but um, we wanna pray for him and pray that he'll be feeling better. So send your prayers, pray for him, send a message, an encouraging message, either on social media or send him a text or however you wanna reach out to him. Just please don't send him nutty bars. Um, last week, as we found in his sermon, his, his professed love for nutty bars, one of our church members sent him a huge box and. Uh, he, he needs your prayers more than the nutty bars. So I'm just jabbing him. Uh, I know he's watching right now. Uh, but we love you as a church body. We miss you. Pray for your pastor. We look forward to the message this morning. And please open your hearts and welcome Pastor Gilbert for the word. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you guys are doing well at home. Uh, Pastor Oscar, if you're watching, thank you for giving me the privilege of filling your, purpose, your pulpit today and preaching uh, to, to LFA. To everybody from LFA who's watching, you're stuck with me this morning, so it's good to, to speak to you. Let us just keep in mind that, uh, as you saw in a video a couple of weeks ago, that the church is not the building. It's us. It's you, wherever you're at. So this is our time to shine, to be the church, to, 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 to the community, to those around you. Especially in, in times like this where things are outside of our control and there's many things and decisions that are being made uh, above us and that we really don't have much of a say so. The word that I bring to you today is uh, very relevant in the sense of being uh, somebody who was being made decisions, who was make, being made decisions on behalf of her without her actually having a say so or anything. So here uh, I bring to you this message called The God Who Sees Me. I'm going to be preaching out of the book of Genesis, chapter 16, starting in verse 1. And uh, we're going to cover most of the chapter. But uh, there are some really important points that are, I think, very relevant for you and I uh, today in this situation that we're living. So Genesis, chapter 16, verse 1, starts telling us a little bit about the story of Hagar. See, Abraham and Sarai or Abraham at this time, Abraham and Sarai, they were, they were married. God had made a promise that they were going to have uh, this, this children, that they're going to have many descendants. But the fact remained that, that Sarai was unable to bear children. So she was sterile at the time, and she was, uh, she was not able to bear children. How many know that God does things in his own time? And things were not happening apparently quick enough to, for Sarai and, and Abraham, specifically Sarai in this time. And she's saying, well, there's, nothing's happening, so maybe we need to help God along. Maybe we need to do something. So she made a decision that uh, probably complicated things somewhat, you know, just like what happens to us. When we start becoming impatient and we're not waiting on God and we want to do things on our own. Sometimes we ourselves get into some very interesting situations. Here, this is happening. So Genesis chapter 16, verse 1, reads this. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build you a family through her. Abram agreed to, Sarah, to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai 
his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to, the husband, to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, Sarai she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So, Abraham, so Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. And this is the word of the Lord. Spirit of the living God, I pray that you... Um, Guide my words today, Lord Jesus, that you have your way in this place, that it is your wisdom and the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, to transform the hearts, to speak to the hearts and the minds of your people, Lord Jesus, that to encourage them, to lift them up in this moment, Father God, as we go through this pandemic. I pray for their needs. I pray for their health. And I pray that you have your way here in this house today, Lord Jesus. Have your way. Amen and amen. Well, the first thing I would like to address is being in a state of powerlessness, being powerless. Because this is a situation where it's, it's very frustrating and it can be very anxiety and depressive, you know, we produce anxiety and depression when we're in a situation like this. We, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that because where, where people are making decisions and others are making decisions about you, and you have no say-so. And we see it here in the Word when we're looking at, Sarai's, uh, at, at Sarai and Abram. They're basically discussing the fate of this slave of Sarai and uh, how she's going to now bore, bear a child for Abram. I mean, she doesn't have a word on this because she is a slave. She doesn't have a word. She doesn't have a say-so. Uh, she is being basically commanded, or as they say in the military, voluntold to, uh, to do this. So it, it's a situation where sometimes we, we're, we're put in and where other individuals are making decisions about us. Maybe that has happened to you at work. Maybe it's happening to you today where, you know, who would have thought uh, two months ago or a month ago, a month and a half ago, where we would be actually told by our government, our local government, our federal government, our state government, when we can go to the gym, uh, when we can go to, the, I mean, if we go to the store up to what time, until what time can we be out uh, and about in the city? You know, my son, for example, he loves fishing, and, and he asks me all the time, Dad, can we go fishing? Can we go fishing? We have access to the lake uh, here in Laredo, but we can't go because it's closed. I mean, and, and I understand, I'm not disputing the fact of, of why this things, the, the safety measures are in place, but we can't, we can't do it. So we have to find alternative things to do. Uh, when were we, when we thought that we were going to be going and trying to just shop for basic essential things like toilet paper and eggs and milk and, and get to the point where, okay, there's only so many people that can enter the store or you have to keep six, 
six feet apart, or you have to be wearing a mask, or, you know, things can happen. There can be consequences. There can be fines associated with things that you're doing because there's decisions that are being made for us. This virus, this, this pandemic is changing everything, and we're being put in a situation when we are powerless. So the Bible speaks a lot about situations like this. There, there's, there's other places in Scripture that tell us about situations similar to this if we look closely. Here we have Hagar. Who, again, people are deciding her fate. They're deciding that she's going to become a mom. And she's not, again, this is not something that she is, has to say so in it. But also we see it in the book of Job. Job is also an interesting character, as if you're familiar with the story, Job is a man who is righteous. He is righteous before God. He, he is a very, very blessed man. He has possessions. He has cattle. He has houses. He has family, a large family. And he, he's righteous before the Lord. He sacrifices for his children. He does all of these things. But unbeknownst to him, there's things happening in the spiritual realm that go beyond his understanding of the situation. And we see here in, in the first chapter of Job, in, the, in verse 6, the story tells us this. One day, the angels came to, the pre, to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But, how, but now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And what happens next is Satan begins to wreak havoc in the life of Job. Things are being destroyed. All his possessions are gone. His cattle is dead. His house is burned down. His family dies. His family dies. This man, it be, he's so broken and he's so uh, brought down, you know, that everything that, that, was, that maybe you and I would consider meaningful was taken from him. But the beauty about this is that he did not break his faith. Everything was taken from him except his faith. He kept loyal to God. He even tell his wife later when, when even his health was taken from him, you know, should we only take the good things from God? How about, not the, how about the bad things? And I'm paraphrasing at this point. But he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So he is, again, put in a situation where decisions are being made for him, and he's suffering the consequence of decisions he had nothing to do with. So it might seem unfair. It might seem like, well, I mean, it could be unfair at one level, looking at it from the, looking at it from the perspective of earth and from, from the perspective of man. There might be a lot of ethical questions that, and issues that might be arising, but their situations, that's just the reality of life. People and situations can be making decisions and we are just completely powerless. Here we see it even in the New Testament, Jesus himself was going through a process similar where decisions were being made about him. When he is being tried, we just, we just celebrated the resurrection a week ago. And if we look closely, in the trial of Jesus, when they bring Jesus and they can't find anything wrong with him and they can't, the, 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 the witnesses couldn't, couldn't agree on their testimonies, so they had to bring him to Pilate because they didn't have the authority to kill or to crucify Jesus. So they brought him before the Roman governor and he had to make a decision. They bring him before him and then there's this, this haggling, this fight that's happening between Pilate and Herod and the, and the, and the chief priests, and, and it, there's this argumentation, and they're all making decisions about Jesus' faith. At least they think they're making a decision over Jesus' faith. Again, Jesus, in an earthly way, is powerless to everything that's being done. 
And I'm saying in an earthly way because we know well that he, has, he had all authority and all power. He could call in 12 legions of agents, angels at the moment and they could come and wreak havoc. But listen, in John 19.4, once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that, if, that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priest and the chief officials saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. But Pilate answered, you take, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I found no basis for a charge against him. Again, he is in a situation where others are making decisions for him. And we see this throughout scripture. We see how the sovereignty of God sometimes, it, it always supersedes ours. And, and, and maybe sometimes the will of man, the will of the world, the will of other people supersede our decision making, our, what we want to do. And we might be stuck in a situation like that. And not only that, it could actually go further into mistreatment. Not only were they making decisions over the fate of Sarai, but also she was... She started to be mistreated. Yes, she had something to do with it. She was not completely innocent because she started despising her mistress. But the, the backlash of that, it was, again, outright mistreatment that happened. So let's talk about being mistreated. Let's talk about that. See, Genesis 16.4 says this. When she knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now she knows that she is pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've been mistreated. I mean, you're being oppressed, and then you're being mistreated, and all you want to do is run away. All you want to do is just throw your hands up in the air and just run and just get out of the situation and just run away and, and just not have anything to do with that. I've been there. Maybe you're there. Maybe we're there right now where we just want to get out. We just want to do the things that we used to be able to do, have the liberties that we were accustomed to. But, there, I mean, even though the state is opening up and they're, they're still a lot of precautions that we need to take. And, and what we know as normalcy might be several months uh, away from us achieving that or going back to that. But running away and being, being abused and being mistreated is something that is very common to us. So what is it that, that happens? I mean, our tendency is to just run away. Our tendency is to get out of the situation, quit the job, do things like that. But that then has consequences because then those things that, that were sustaining us, that those things that were um, bringing us, let's say, income or bringing us security are gone. Listen to what Paul explains. See, Paul is an individual who was a very, very much um, on fire for the Lord. He was somebody who, who was a hard worker for God. And we look at Paul and we look, him, look at him as one of those pillars, right? He wrote most of the, of, the, of the New Testament, a lot of his letters to the different churches that he started. And, and we look at, at Paul as, a, as, a, as an example, as a model, right? Because he would follow Christ and he was so determined. He was so dogged about everything that he did. But Paul went through a lot of mistreatment himself. And there's a portion in Scripture where he actually uh, really shows what he has experienced because when he's writing to the Corinthian church in the second letter to the Corinthians, he's reminding them because people are coming in and saying, look, I have this credentials. Look, I have done this. I have done that. So they're trying to show their pedigree. And, and, and what Paul is trying to do is, listen, we, we don't need to look at pedigrees. We need to look at uh, the substance of what's being taught of, of, the, of, of Jesus Christ crucified. It's not about pedigrees. It's not about this, that, and the other. Because that's what people look at. But God looks at something deeper than that. And, and then he says, okay, if, I'm gonna, if you're going to claim that you've done this, let me, let me just boast like a, like a fool, he says. Let me tell you what are some of the things that I have gone through 
to see if, if I would be considered a, a good apostle. And this is what he says in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, church, uh, verse 23. He says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, I've been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea. And in danger from false believers, I have labored and told and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. So see, sometimes serving the Lord is experiencing this mistreatment. Sometimes serving the Lord, people will mistreat us. The, the, the ministry itself and work, walking with the Lord is going to bring consequences that are not necessarily going to be uh, good or not consequences. I say side effects. Jesus says, you know, in this world you will encounter tribulation. But he says, be of good comfort because I have overcome the world. So let us, even though we're in a situation where we might be, feel powerless, other people are making decisions for us as to when we can go out, what we can do, what we can't do, uh, all of those things. And, and you might probably get to the point that, you know, you've lost your job. You don't have, uh, you don't have a, a means of income right now. Maybe people are making decisions about your car, your houses, uh, your house, or, or what have you. Other people might be after you for money or what have you. You know, you might feel that you're being mistreated or, or maybe just somebody who's, you're in the same house and you're, you're there together and somehow perhaps you're not used to being together and now there, there's friction, there's, there's difficulty, there's fighting, there's, argument, there's arguments going on. Listen, those things can happen and will happen to us. But remember, there is always something. There's always a plan. God has always something greater behind the scenes. So I want you to have hope because we see it in Jesus. Again, when he's being judged, when he's being, people are making decisions above him, something tremendous happens here. In, in, in John 19, 9, we see this, this we, we become privy to a conversation between, between Pontius Pilate and Jesus a private conversation that they have, and it says this, and he went back inside the palace, and this is Pilate, and he asked him, where do you come from, he asked. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? What I love about this passage is Jesus' answer, the conviction and what he entails when he says this. Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Jesus is uncovering a very powerful, a very powerful theme here. That yes, you guys are making decisions over me. But the decisions that you have, the decision-making power that you have has been given to you for, from above. God has allowed you to do this. God has put you in that situation to make that decision, be it good or bad. God has put you in, this, in that position. However, what this entails to me, that this is a greater uh, thing that we need to focus, is God has a plan. God has a plan. Maybe things don't make sense to us. Maybe things are completely unfair around us, and we're in desperation. We want to run away. We want to do this. We want to, we're being mistreated. Everything's going wrong. God is telling you, just everything that's happening, just trust. Just trust me. Everything that's happening, there is a plan. There is a greater plan. And my words might sound a little bit hollow right now because you probably want something more practical. And this is exactly where I'm going. And I want to tell you that God sees everything. God sees your situation. I want to talk to you about being seen. This is the last point I'd like to make. This 
is one of the names of God. One of the names that, that, that is discussed in scripture, and, and, and he has so many names. You know, we have, uh, we have Adonai, we have uh, El, 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 El Elohim, we have uh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah uh, Sidkenu, Jehovah Mekodishkem, uh, Jehovah Kana. We see, we see so many of those names. It, it is important for us to understand what they mean because those describe characteristics. But here is El Roy, the God who sees me. Listen, this is the conclusion that Hagar, in her desperation, comes to that conclusion. Because once she gets to that process of being, there's decision being made about her. Maybe because of the frustration of the situation, she lashes back out. And she starts despising her her, her mistress, and then there's that conflict, and she, she, because of that, then she's being mistreated to the point that she has to run away. Now, if we put it in context, uh, Abram and his family, they, they were nomads. They had tents. They were living from place to place, and sometimes in places that there was not necessarily a lot of resources around, maybe in the middle of the desert. So running away from there could probably spell death, especially if you were pregnant. So she runs away into this barren wasteland, and uh, out of all the places that she goes, she goes to a, she goes to a, a well. She goes to a watering hole to, to quench her thirst and, and maybe figure out how to survive now that she's out. Genesis chapter 16, 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar, found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar... Slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? It's interesting to note that every time that God asks a question, it's not that he doesn't know the answer. And even though this is the angel of the Lord, still, you know, there's, there's, there's supernatural knowledge here. It's not that he didn't know. It's really more of a rhetorical question for Sarai to ponder, not Sarai, but Hagar to, to, to ponder on. Where have you come from and where are you going? I am running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. And, and we see he starts describing her son. And then in verse 13, she gave this name, to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Now, this is, this is what I love about this passage. Here's this woman that has run away. She's been mistreated, and she's been in a very dire situation, and she is with child. And she's now in the middle of the desert, running away from the difficulties, running away from her problems, running away from her past, running away from her mistakes, running away from whatever. And now she finds herself in dire straits. She's in the middle of the desert. She's pregnant. She has probably no food, no resources. And she is near, near a well, near a spring, near a place where there's no And she was going towards that. She obviously had needs that needed to be met. But what I love about this passage is that says the angel of the Lord found her. And again, Pastor, or Pastor Oscar, he's, he's now learning about literature and he's learning about how to dissect every sentence and every word and, and how the sentence and the intentions and all of that stuff. And, and, and maybe the, what, it, what the sentence is really trying to say and the author is trying to say. And here's something very powerful. is the, the angel of the Lord found her, which then... It implicates she was being looked for. She was being looked for. God, God was aware that she was not where she was supposed to be. So he is looking for her, and he finds her. He finds her near this well, and he starts speaking to her. Now, she felt that it was all over. She probably felt that she was going to die. She probably felt that all those things that she had worked for, and probably she was pondering on how miserable her life was. And guess what? The angel of the Lord shows up, finds her, and starts telling her and starts speaking to her about the future. Not only does he start speaking, you're going to be okay. 
There's a plan. You're going to have a child. He's going to be a boy, by the way, and you're going to name him Ishmael. And Ishmael is going to grow up, and you're going to have very numerous descendants to the point that you won't be able to count them. Imagine those words for somebody who's probably thinking, this is it, I'm dying right here. No, there's the future. There's a greater plan. There's greater things that are going to happen. The situation has nothing to do with the, with the provision that I have for you. The situation, the, the reality of things have nothing to do with the plans that I have for you. So here, God is speaking to her. God is, and then, because, and he said, because God has heard you, and God has seen your, has heard, and he's seen your misery. And then she realizes there is somebody who sees me. There is somebody who is watching. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you, where you feel that, that God has turned his back on you. The situation is so dire and so difficult that you feel God's no longer listening. God no longer is God's too busy running the universe. God, you know, is, is, is completely turned his back on me. Maybe God doesn't even exist. And let me tell you something. God sees you. We have a God who sees us. We have a God who understands. Matthew tells us that every head on our hair, and every hair on our head is numbered. So he knows intimately everything. In Matthew chapter 6, we hear this, that God knows of our needs before we even ask him. We know, we, he actually mentions it twice in that chapter. So it's, very, it's a very sovereign moment when, when, when God shows up. Then this is not the only time that this happens. There's several. Again, this is a theme that recurs in Scripture over and over. Let me tell you about another passage of Scripture where somebody was so afraid and so frustrated and so overwhelmed by the situation that he ran away. Not only did he run away, he was so frustrated and, and so overwhelmed by the situation that he was actually suicidal. Do you know who I'm talking about? I'm talking about Elijah, the prophet Elijah, the mighty prophet, the mighty man of God, the man who could call fire from the sky, the man who defeated this, the, the 400 prophets of, of Baal and the other 300 prophets of, of Asherah, and he had just single-handedly destroyed all of them, and he had done, God has done a tremendous miracle and a tremendous demonstration to everybody that God, the God of Elijah, is the real God, the one and only God, after bringing down the fire. And you see all of that in 1 Kings chapter 18. But after, after he had killed all the prophets, all the false prophets of Asherah and Baal and all these pagan prophets, he had destroyed all of them. Then word comes to, um, comes to the queen, at, who at the time was uh, Jezebel. And Jezebel hears about this, and she's enraged. So she basically puts a bounty on his head, and she wants to have him killed. And this was a very vicious individual, a very vicious woman. When Elijah finds out about this, all these decisions are being made about him. So he runs away. He runs away, and this is what happens. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Again, we see this fleeing and running away. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, a broom bush sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. And, and he, here we see this point of desperation. He's, given, he's getting ready to die. He's like, I'm giving up. I, I have the, this ultimate, uh, I, I've reached the end of my rope. I, I, I want to die. I can't take this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't continue in this. This is too much for me. And he's, he falls asleep in his sorrow, in his desperation. He falls asleep. And then, and, and, and then it says this, and, and, at, and at once the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then Lay down, lay down again. And, and what we see here is, again, he was in the middle of nowhere. He had run away. 
he was several days journey away from where he was supposed to be and in his sorrow and his desperation the angel showed up an angel showed up and provided nourishment for him reminding him like hey wake up we got things to do don't look at the situation there's a greater plan there's greater things afoot here God is seeing you. God knows what's happening. God knows what you're going through. God knows what you're experiencing right now. God knows about your situation. God knows about your desperation. And you might be in the middle of nowhere. You might be on the end of your rope right now. God is with you. God has a plan. There's, there's, there's nowhere that we can go from the Lord. I love what, what, what Paul tells us in the book of, 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 of Romans in, in the eighth chapter. And when he says, you know, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. As a matter of fact, he says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us because I am convinced that neither height nor death nor death nor living or anything created. And, and then he goes on into the litany of, of list of things that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So no matter what you're going through, be faithful. Remain faithful. Know that God has a greater plan. He has great things for you. Maybe things are, are dire, maybe, but God has a plan. Listen, we sometimes want to run away and go away from all things, and, 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 but we cannot run away from God. There's nowhere, there's no distance, there's no place. And this was what I'm going to conclude with. This is what, what uh, David came to this conclusion as he was writing Psalm 139. He was talking about the omnipresence of God, the omniscience of God, how wherever there is no place that we can go away from him, he's always there. He's always seeing us. He's always aware of what's happening in our lives. And he always finds a way of providing. Listen, Psalm 139, verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I race to the wind of, on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand would hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. No matter where we're at, no matter how far we run away from everything, God can still reach us. God can still be there. God is fully aware of everything that is happening. And he will provide. And he will make things, you know, make his will happen. And, and therefore, I want to, to, to just to, to summarize. You might be in a situation that you're powerless. Decisions are being made for you, about you. Without your input, there's things that you have no power, you have no control over. You might even be being mistreated, and it might be an unfair situation for you. But even in the midst of all of this, God, God is still seeing you. God still knows about you. Don't let the enemy, don't let your friend, don't let anything that this situation dictate to you what God is doing. I heard once this preacher say this, and this really stuck with me. Do not confuse God's silence for God's absence. God is there in the midst of everything. I'd like to conclude with prayer today. So I want to pray for any situation that you might be in, any needs that you might have, but also I want to pray if you are hearing this message and, and you say, okay, this is the time for me. I'm done running away from you, Lord. I want to give my life to you. I want to serve you. I want to, I want to receive you as my Savior. I want to have that hope in everything that I just talked about. So I'm going to give that opportunity. First, I'm going to pray over any needs, and then we're going to pray over for salvation. So, Father God, I, I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for allowing me to preach out of your word. I pray for any person that is hearing us today, that is hearing us on, 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 you know, at home during this quarantine, and I pray that you start manifesting in their lives, Father God, that you start bringing peace 
in the midst of the storm, that you start bringing stability in the midst of the stability, that you start bringing light in the midst of this darkness, Father, that you remind them that, in, that despite the situation, despite their powerlessness, despite, Father, any mistreatment, you are still there. You know exactly what's happening, and you will show up, that you will, Father God, manifest yourself. Father, I pray that you bring peace into their lives, that you bring provision for them supernaturally, Lord Jesus, just as you did for Hagar, just as you did for Elijah, Father. I pray that you provide and, and meet their needs, Father, if it's financial, Father, if it's relational, if it is their health, Father. I pray that you bring healing for all those who are sick of any disease, Father. I pray that you bring healing because your word says that by your stripes we have been healed. I pray for these families that you put a hedge of protection around them and that your spirit f fills them, Father, with power and with peace, with love, with a sound mind in the midst of this tribulation. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, now I pray for anybody who wants to receive you. Father, repeat this with me. If, you, if you're listening and you want to, just say, Lord, I'm done running from you. Just repeat this with me. Pray, say this prayer with me. Remember, this prayer is not this, there's not some magical words. What you're doing is you're just accepting Jesus into your Christ. And this is the first step to a very long process of being discipled and learning more about the word. So please take every advantage of understanding and learning about the word and find somebody to disciple you through this process. Father God, I thank you, Lord Jesus for your mercy. I thank you for what you did on the cross for me. I that you, Father God, now use me in your kingdom. That you, Father God, move in my life. That, that you transform me and give me a purpose to serve you in your kingdom. Father, have your way in my life. Thank you for transforming me. Thank you for wiping away my sin. Thank you for making me into a new creation. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may he cause his face to shine upon you, may he give you grace and peace for now and evermore. Have a great day in the Lord. Give us a like and share the sermon with somebody you love. Be blessed, everybody.